Great to have you with us. Now, all is set for the referendum for the creation of the new regions to come off on the 27th of December 2018. Presenting a roadmap for the creation of the new regions after the Supreme Court dismissed the injunctions yesterday, Minister in charge of regional reorganization uh, Dan Boche noted that the constitutional instruments laid in Parliament last month will be fully matured and gazetted today uh, to see to the kickoff of the referendum. He also noted that each of the new regions will receive seed capital of 20 million Ghana cities for resources and amenities. Nancy Amafat Dradosi was at this press conference. Um, she joins me in studio with the latest with the details of what was said by uh, Mr. Dan Boche, Minister for Regional Reorganization and Integration. Now, a bit of background to this one. Um, an injunction was laid on the process to hold the referendum for the creation of the new regions. And that the Supreme Court reached a decision on that yesterday. Uh, they have quashed uh, that injunction and they have allowed uh, governments to go on with the processes needed to to uh, hold a referendum and create these regions. MFA Jadosi was at the news conference. He joins me now. MFA, um, what else was said at the news conference? So you mentioned that even though everything is said after the injunction was dismissed yesterday, um, they need some guidelines to be able to help them to be able to carry out this election or this referendum on the 27th. And that's the CI, the constitutional instrument, which they laid um, before Parliament exactly a month ago. And so basically all they are saying is that today is a deadline. Today is when the constitutional in instrument will mature and will be gazetted by Parliament so that they will set off um, for this particular referendum to take place on the 27th of December. Now, you mentioned that there were some qualifications needed by the petitioners. Yes. So he mentioned that for those regions that petition the president for the region to be created, they need at least 50% voter turnout. That is the first qualification. So you need to be 50%. And then out of the 50%, 80% of those people must vote for yes. And so if they are 50 and they vote 75 or 79%, you're not going to get the region. And also, if the voter turnout tends to be 40% and you even get 100% saying yes, you are still not going to get um, your regions created. What of this 20 million allocation that each of the regions will get? So after the referendum, those who will be successful um, in getting their regions, government is allocating 20 million Ghana cities as seed, seed capital, um, for them to put together the resources they need to start as a region. And so in total, they are budgeting about 120 million Ghana cities for the six um, regions that we want to be created. Thanks, Emma Fajardosi, for... Uh, the latest on this issue. Uh, stay with us as we keep you updated on this particular uh, referendum that will be taking place. You're still watching Joy News today. Now, a member of uh, former President Bahamas campaign team and member of parliament for Ododo Dio Dio, Nilante Van der Poy, has revealed uh, the security detail who slapped multimedia journalist Parker Wilson while he was covering Mr. Mohammed's campaign at Pentecost University College as part of his five-day tour of the greater Accra region has been identified and suspended. It will be recalled that uh, a month ago, Parker was left visibly bruised with part, with part of his face swollen and his right eye teary after the said security detail hit him in the face for insisting to gain access to the former president with his cameraman. A statement issued and signed by spokesperson for the ex-president, James Ejeni Watting, shortly after the incident saw the ex-president apologizing to the reporter um, while assuring the issue was being investigated. Now, speaking on the AM show this morning, with my colleague, Mama V. Osuabwaje, MP for Ododo Dio Dio Nilante Van der Poy revealed the suspect has been identified and suspended. The person who assaulted Paka has been dealt with. How? And it's, it's, it's <laughs> no more. He's no more around the campaign. So he's been he's identified. Security. He's yes. been identified. Yes. The security, so, so how the was security, he dealt with? The security. One, he's been suspended. He's been suspended. <laughs> and you know what steps have been taken by the office to make sure Parker is appropriately compensated and Parker is appropriately But But this uh, is, this is a with. crime, assaulting someone. Yes. And we know that the police were supposed to be coordinating with the campaign team. So I am very optimistic. The last time I talked to James Ajini Martin, the office is coordinating with the police very well on this issue. And the police are preparing. Uh, whenever they, they, they are ready to take action, the person will be handed over to them for the police to take the necessary. We will not condone that act. We will not support any uh, assault on any journalist. 
whoever it is. It is not right. As I sit here. Just, just finally, um, mm -hmm. is, the, is the appropriate punishment the suspension? That's what the team As far as our side is concerned. But then the, the, so the he's rest. He's on su suspension this for is, how long? This is, this is not. He's on suspension this is, for how long? This is not. I will not be able to tell you, but what I know that he's on suspension independently, I'm, I'm sure, because James did not give me a specific time. And once there's no time limit to it, I presume Thank it's you indefinite. Very much. Now, Executive Director for the Media Foundation for West Africa, Suleiman Abrahima, says the former president and his campaign team must reveal the identity of the suspended security detail to authenticate their claim. He also urged the police indicates the criminal charges that will be preferred against the suspect. He spoke to Bernice Apubedu Lanza on News Desk an hour ago. The welcoming development. Uh, it takes out um, the fact that, well, such acts of violation or abuses um, wouldn't be countenance. And given that it is coming from the camp of the former president, whose aide, when he was president, acted um, in a similar way, and there was a campaign, and that campaign was not heeded to, I would say it's welcoming. Mm. But having said that, I think what's most important is not to just end it because they say they've identified the person and suspended them. Because as we know, uh, after all, it's, it's a criminal case, and I'm happy that multimedia well, didn't also just talk about it or complain about it, but went ahead to report the matter. Mm -hmm. So now, if people from the camp are saying we've identified the person and suspended um, him, I believe that they would do the right thing by cooperating with the police, um, uh, helping the police to investigate the matter. And I think that is what is even much more significant. So mm. we look forward to the police now taking over the matter and thoroughly investigating it and, you know, um, serving justice where justice must be done. Mr. Brimer, um, one may argue that you and I cannot verify if this man uh, or whoever it is that uh, hit my colleague has really been sus suspended because we don't know who he is, we don't know what he looks like, so we cannot verify even if he's still moving with the president. Do you think naming, shaming, and even showing this person uh, will be uh, de deterring enough to other people? Well, I, I think, I think Honorable uh, Nilan is quite um, an integral part of uh, the former president's campaign team. Um, and therefore, if he has come out publicly to say that the person has been identified, um, I believe if the police has any difficulty in identifying who the person is, I'm sure uh, Honorable Lante can uh, briefly assist in, in that regard. And uh, as I indicated, what is important for me is the police investigating the matter and then um, we pursuing justice for, for the victim. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not the person would still be moving with the former president uh, is another matter. Uh, if the police investigates that the matter to go to court and um, the court decides that what he did was criminal, and therefore some sanctions apply, uh, depending on the nature of the sanctions, uh, the, the person could still be moving with the um, former president, but would have then taken note of the fact that you cannot commit such acts and, and go scot free. In other words, impunity cannot charge. And I believe that would also serve as an example for others who may be harboring similar intentions against just not just journalists, but individuals who they feel they have done something that they don't they don't like. And uh, as I indicated earlier, for me, the police action is what we should all look forward to at the moment. My colleague Parker Wilson still complains of pains in the left eye, um, in the eye, I mean, which was hit. Let's get to him on the phone lines and get a reaction after this development. Parker, how are you doing? Daniel, by his grace, I still manage my father. And after this incident, um, how is your eye feeling? Well, Daniel, it's been quite unpleasant for me as an individual knowing that I had my two eyes working. I didn't have any problem with it, but the impact the slump had on my eye. Well, my last review, the doctor indeed indicated that I had uh, my, my vision, my right eye, I should say, was deteriorating and that I would need a spectacle to aid my sight. 
which in about three, four days' time, and he handed it over to me, the spectacle. And so now, as we speak, Daniel, I can only read or probably um, see light only with the spectacle. I cannot do that without my eye, because when I do that, there is this burning sensation that I get in the eye, and the pain is still there. I still feel the pain in my right eye, and it's been very disappointing and quite unpleasant for me and my family. And the last time I saw you, you were wearing these glasses, and we had this conversation. But there's a new development now. The man who slapped you has been suspended from uh, the former president's security detail. How does that make you feel? Um, well, I'm sure you're expecting that. I would say I feel happy about it, but I don't think so. Um, that, that shouldn't be the best punishment. That should be mentioned out to the young man who has not him. Because you will agree with me that it is illegal for a crime to be reported and the perpetrator perhaps makes a deal and says that, can you suspend me, but don't pursue me criminal. A criminal key has been brought and must be investigated. The court will have to decide whether or not let the perpetrator go or punish the perpetrator based on the evidence available. And here we are, knowing very well that the campaign team indeed have to recognize or identify the young man who assaulted. So I am expecting that as a matter of agency, they will hand over the guy to the police for the police to continue the investigation. What the Mahama campaign team has done is to only carry out their administrative duty. Because here yes, is an administrative process to suspend the individual. But there is a criminal key. And so even the police, I expect that by now, they should be contacting the campaign team of the former president of the Mani Mahama, requesting of them to produce the guy who assaulted me so that at least they can assist with the investigation, and then the court will decide what to do next. Now, so for me, for me, Daniel, I mean, mm -hmm. that's not the best uh, uh, punishment that should, that should be meted out to the young man uh, who assaulted me. Speaking of the police, Parker, how have your dealings with them been? Have they contacted you to give any information? Well, I, I've been getting reports from them that, oh, we are still on the investigation, and that we will let you know when there's any new development. And again, they requested of me, or they asked me that if I also have any new development or any new information that I want, I think perhaps I should hand over the information to them. And so with this new information that we have as multimedia, we are expecting that when we hand over this information to them, they will quickly get to the campaign managers of uh, the former president and get the guy and then assist, I mean, the guy should ask us with investigation. And then uh, let me say that this is not the first time I have been. Uh, two days after the incident, I was told, when I was informed, that the guy had been uh, identified. And so I asked myself, it's been over a month. Are they now coming out to say that the guy has been identified and he has been suspended? And they expect that the sympathizers, those who were seeking justice for me, should be OK with it and say, that's fine, we should let it go. I don't think so. I think this should them as a deterrent to others who tend to assault journalists in the line of duty. And I believe that the court will have to decide whether the young man should be allowed to go free or perhaps he, has, he must be uh, punished. And, and that would be my view. So I demand that the campaign managers of the former president, John Domani Mama, hand over the guy to the police for the police to investigate him. Claire. Thank you, Parker Wilson, for speaking to us this afternoon. Um, we had scheduled to speak with the Accra Region PRO for the police, uh, Madame Efia Tenge. Uh, she tells us now that she's in a meeting and she cannot speak with us in that interview. Um, so we are still working the phone lines when she comes out of that meeting. If uh, we are still having this bulletin, we will speak with her. Uh, now, let's move and speak to one, uh, another issue now. And surgeries are very important procedures undertaking to correct injuries or disorders. 
but it can be very painful and sometimes leave patients with complications such as excessive bleeding, infections and sometimes disturbing scars. In the following Joy News Health Desk report, Matilda Omega finds out how doctors at the Accra Regional Hospitals are applying laparoscopy, a low-risk, minimally invasive procedure that makes surgery safer, less painful and leaves almost no scar. And guess what? It's also less expensive. I will look at your duodenum to see if there's any problem. And sometimes you're able to solve the problem using that device because there are ports there problem. It's Head of clinical service at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, Dr. Ralph Ama, demonstrating how the laparoscopic surgery technique works. More than 140 surgeries have so far been conducted here using the laparoscopic procedure. It's a modern surgical technique under which surgical operations are performed without big openings of the body parts of the patient. The doctors create a small opening in the body through which a device is inserted. This device then projects the internal part system on the screen where doctors can discover and address various ailments. The technique is not exactly new in hospitals around the world, but it's the first of its kind at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Health experts say this procedure has a number of advantages compared to the regular process of open surgery because the pain and bleeding are reduced due to the smaller opening. Recovery times are also better. Here is Head of Clinical Service at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, Dr. Ralph Ama. In the open procedure, um, you would need anesthesia. Yes, here you would need anesthesia, but it's not as deep as the open procedure. We'll just give you something that makes you sleep a little because um, putting that through your mouth may be a little uncomfortable. So we'll give you some anesthesia, make the place numb so that you can swallow out to look at it. Some people retch, so we'll give you something to prevent you from retching. Then for the one that is the lower, because we use the gas to distend the intestines, it's a little discomforting. So we'll give you something for the pain and we use it to do it. But in the open procedure, you would have scars and a mark for something, an intervention having been done. But in this one, you won't have any scar and you just wake up and walk out of this place. That's it? Yes, that's it. And is it for every case or you have specific cases that requires this procedure? Yes, it's basically specific cases that we use this for. So for people who have stomach ulcers, for people who have um, swallowed something inadvertently, like a foreign object, like um, a button, or the person has a fish bone stuck in the throat, we can use this to be able to intervene instead of going to open up and giving the person a scar. In the open procedure, you would have scars and a mark for something, an intervention having been done. But in this one, you won't have any scar, and you just wake up and walk out of this place. Dr. Emmanuel Sofrenyo is the medical director at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. About eight doctors or so have already been trained in this area, and currently, as we are here, two of our doctors are there in South Korea, and each, each group spends six months uh, over there in South Korea. And the training, uh, part of the training takes place here. Uh, the first training is a simulation you know, on a dummy, which is not a human being, when it's not a live substance. And so that is done when you achieve a certain degree of experience, then you, are, you move to an animal model. Okay. Yes, you are moved to an animal model where you practice on a live animal. Mm -hmm. And then the final stage is that when we see that you have achieved a certain level of proficiency, then now you are moved to a human being. Mm -hmm. So that is what we call the humanistic theory, okay. so that uh, people are not trained on human beings. The government of Korea, through the Korea International Cooperation Agency, is supporting the laparoscopic unit with equipment worth $41,000 and additional $9,000 for the training of nurses and doctors at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Matilda Pamaga for Joy News, Accra. Exciting things happening in our hospitals. You're still watching Join News today with me, Daniel Daze. Still up ahead on Tech Thursday. We will tell you all you need to know about the smoke detection app developed by a 26-year-old which can be exploited for safety. Also in business, Chartered Institute of Bankers Ghana to present report on accounting firms 
that supervised troubled banks in two weeks. All that and more coming up. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Now, Ghana has recorded at least eight major gas explosions in the past few years. Six in the Greater Accra region, one in Takwadi in the western region, and one at Kaswa in the central region. In all these incidents, dozens of people have been killed and many more injured. But on Tech Thursday today, we put the spotlight on an app and installation which could detect smoke and gas leakages in homes and fuel stations real time. Komla Adum has more. It is a smart app that works with a smart detector. 26-year-old founder of Personet, Joshua Jiman, believes installing the application at fuel stations and homes is a lifesaver. And here's why. So this also, the concept was to be able to detect smoke real time. Last month, I, I was in one of the offices, it was a very reputable company, and their ceiling were burning. Like, it was really burning, but the device were there, they couldn't detect it. Human beings were smelling the smoke, and we have to run before they have to come and trigger an alarm. So we realized the device works all right, but the other side of it, they are all analog. So until the fire is burning, they can't really sense the smoke. This will sense the smoke real time, wherever you are. And whenever it reaches a threshold that you think it's, it's beyond your expectation, it triggers an alarm. By upscaling this smart smoke detector application, lives and properties could be saved and the impact of some of the explosions could be mitigated. It has a sensor that is able to detect smoke, fire and LPG gas leakages. This also is a temperature and humidity. So combining the two, you'll be able to know whether the smoke you are measuring has a moisture content or has a hot temperature. Based on those data we collect, we can now run an algorithm to predict whether it's fire, it's gas leakages, or is this some neighboring smoke or something? Yeah. So there you have it. Your homes, offices, warehouses, gas and fuel stations just got a life and property saving intervention. When fixed in your house or warehouses, your coastal, it's able to tell you the temperature and humidity reading right to your phone, wherever you are. So you can have this installed in your house or your warehouse in maybe Tema, and it can be in Accra or even travel outside and still read the readings of it, wherever you are. Joshua Ajiman's smart smoke and fire detector prototype is awaiting approval from the relevant authorities and will soon be available on Android and iOS devices. At the moment, the app is not available on Play Store, mm -hmm. so you, we, we have it online. So you launch the browser, then it opens for you to log in, then you tap on login, then it loads for you. So th this platform we have can accommodate a lot of devices. So if you have the device in your home, your bedroom, or place, you can have them on one screen. So on each screen, you'll be able to control each appliances with the screen you have. Now at Yanke, in the Upper East region, the residents depend on only one borehole for water. As the Hamatan sets in with the attendant dry winds in the northern zone, Residents are unsure how to overcome the annual water challenge during that season of the year. In the following report, Joy News' Mahmoud Mohamed Nuruddin tells how the 41-year-old borehole continues to serve the people despite little maintenance over the years. We'll bring you that story shortly, but before that, Energy Minister John Peter Amewu has apologized to Ghanaians and businesses for the inconvenience and damage the recent power outages might have caused them. Parts of the country have experienced unannounced outages in the last few weeks, prompting fears that the dreaded Dumso is back. Speaking on PM Express Wednesday, Energy Minister John Peter Amewu apologized and took full responsibility for the problem and assured government is working permanently, is working to permanently fix the situation. Well, as a government and as an energy minister, um, I want to say uh, very sorry to Ghanaians, especially those uh, that have experienced uh, this uh, period of intermittent power supply. Uh, of course, as a minister, I'm responsible. That is why I'm here. I take the blame. 
uh, but I want to assure them that uh, uh, it's, it was as a result of you know a number of events that have occurred, and this has nothing you know to do with financial issues. It has nothing to do with a planning system, but it's a mere coincidence of events that occurred as a result of contingencies that are unforeseen. And as a ministry, we put in measures, as I've stated earlier on, to make sure that we address this. Um, some people, you know, during the period spoke, they lost their televisions as a result of this. Some of them got their um, uh, TVs, you know, and a lot of other things being damaged. Well, of course, again, we want to apologize for that and, and let them understand that this will never happen again. Now, former Power Minister Dr. Kwamna Donko, who appeared on Joy News, uh, on Upfront on Joy News last night, said uh, the reduction in electricity tariffs during the last tariff review is a contributory factor. But we still have a basic finance problem in the sector. You see, let me take the last tariff adjustment. Yeah. The last tariff adjustment did not help the energy sector. It was 17.5 for residential. The yeah. businesses were getting almost 30%. Yeah, it was good for the populace because it was short term. Um, the government got applause for it, but it was very, very, very unhelpful to the power sector institutions. But it, they didn't complain. The they ECG, did. The ECG did not, when we asked them, say, oh, well, they implemented nicely. If your employer, okay, your shareholder, I see takes a decision, you you, can't contradict you, that, really. you'll be very stupid to come out to contradict it. Mm. In 2016, ECG made profits. 2017, they made losses. 2018, they made losses. And you say this is just because we reduced the tariffs? No, it's one of the contributory factors. Oh, one of them? Yes. I mean, uh, when you are dealing with an entity, there is usually not just one cause. But that contributing cause could be major. Uh, Gridco the most sensitive of all the power sector institutions in my opinion gridco is the most critical gridco had to forego 80 percent of their planned capital expenditure this year because of the tariff reduction and they told you that yes i mean it's they presented their budget to the committee of mines and energy and why they had to shelve some part of their capital expenditure mm -hmm. if you don't have the revenue flow you had projected you see, let's not let's move away from this NDC MPP thing. Mm -hmm. It's unhelpful, and it's been one of the challenges we've had in this country, especially in the power sector. You see, when the fundamentals are wrong, to borrow from our vice president, <laughs> you will be exposed. Okay. But Energy Minister Peter Amewu says, though governments need money to normalize the situation, increasing tariffs is not an option being considered. If the regulator prescribed the need for review of tariff, of course, to be subjected to a lot of uh, 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 discussions, debates, you know, and if, it's, if it is possible or if it can be done without putting burdens on Ghanaians, one government, that. for reasons, has uh, been able to establish that the cost of tariff is, of course, competitive and, and it meets the necessary cost obligations. Of course, there will not be any justifications for, for increase. Yeah. We, cannot... we increase tariffs based on cost scenarios. As of when your, co your tariff is not cost reflective, then of course there's that justification. But ECG can't pay his debts. Yeah, ECG... They need to raise money, and one of the key ways is through tariffs. Yeah, but don't forget some of the debts overhang on ECG. It keeps paying them, yes, like but some of this government. But, but we, I, just yeah, recently, so... I just recently heard from Mr. Yeah. Ware, your good friend yeah. at, at Bwipa. He says ECG owes them in excess of 200 million CDs that mm -hmm. they can't pay them. Yeah, and again, so ECG would need the tariffs to pay. So ECG also need to do a lot more of efficiency management. I, I get you. Okay, I get because you. the debts are but not you need just to meet them halfway. Precisely, government has been meeting ECG as I stated. Government over one the period of the has paid a lot of tariff increases. No, the necessary way of addressing our okay. debts in terms of clearing the debt. If you increase tariff and there's a huge amount of inefficiency still in the system, you keep on increasing tariff each and mm. then. So we need to address that basic problem, the generation losses, the transmission losses, supply losses, emitting losses. There are a lot of losses along mm. this the power theft, mm. you know, and see how the system, because if you put all these losses together in the range of about 23, 25%, that is huge. Okay. 
No, that no, is so true. What you, it means is that those twenty five percent are cost of it. this. You know, are, are, this are you am, categorically? So watching Joy News today with me, Daniel Dazi, Sandra Esenamafenu is standing by with the latest in business.